he's a little depressed. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. So one thing we've been seeing in the last uh, year and a half, two years, is that um, <clears throat> like in Orange County and other words, especially the south facing beaches, which might be similar to what you guys are predicting, mm -hmm. um, we're seeing sand robbing in the summertime and stuff eroding away. And um, the manage the the public works agencies of the county or, or region um, don't know what to do yeah. because they're like, oh, this is like a typical winter storm, mm -hmm. but wait, it's happening in the summertime, so let's let's not do anything because we don't know. And so you know, parking's affected, people's yeah. ability. And it seems like that's becoming the new normal, right? That, that we're not going to be accreting sand in the summertime, that, we're, that we might be getting these, more commonly at least, getting these southern swells that, that hit us in other times of the years too. Right, yeah, so the southern ocean has been getting more energetic over the last two decades, and it's projected to get even more energetic. And basically all the storm tracks are moving into the sort of south of Australia, and it's already a very energetic ocean. But with more stor the storms moving even further south, there's basically fetch limited. So the waves can build mm -hmm. as big as they can mm -hmm. build, and then mm -hmm. we get ultimately the impact of those waves from these long period, like one or two meter, 20, 25 second wave events that are really big on these south facing beaches. The other thing is that with El Nino, um, it drives more tropical events in the eastern Pacific. So we typically have maybe two or three, four events down spinning off of Mexico, and then go to Hawaii or somewhere else. And like this last uh, summer fall, like there were a dozen storms, so a lot more events. And so if we're going to have more extreme El Ninos, then we're probably going to have more tropical activity that can affect these south-facing beaches. And then the other factor is there's a lot less sand out there. We've been damming rivers, we've been cutting off sand supplies um, for the last century. And some of Gary's work shows it's about a 30% decrease in, in sand to the w out of the watersheds over the last century or so. It's all good. We're mining it out of, yeah. uh, out of the eastern Ventura County. You're going to put it on uh, Broad Beach. Right. So it's all good. Don't right. worry. Right. Right. <laughs> right. So there's all a, definitely a confluence of factors and hard to put your finger on any one. But that's uh, not a lot of great news. <laughs> but we have time. I mean, there's part of this is, yeah, there could be storm impacts now that are, could be significant. But we do have time. It's not the biggest impacts are probably not going to happen until mid-century and beyond. We really to start to see major, major impacts. Yeah. So when you're dealing with um, policy, you said do you have plans? Are you guys discussing what kinds of things they can do besides putting up giant rock walls? Or something? <laughs> right. That's a definitely an area of uh, was lots and lots of people jumping in. Um, yeah, the state put sort of handed down guidance and you have to deal with sea level rise, and no one really knew what to do, and there wasn't data to support it, and so we tried to fill that niche. And there's lots and lots of consultants now looking at coastal adaptation and trying to work with these communities. Like, what do you actually do? Do you build a seawall? Do you, you know, build up your dune system? Do you do periodic beach nourishments? Do you do, you know, relocation, which they've done in places like Pacifica. They actually moved a dozen homes off the beach. Just get people out of the way. That's not going to happen in a lot of areas. And I think, like in San Francisco Bay, is probably going to look like New Orleans eventually. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see Google moving. I don't see Cisco moving. All these companies aren't going to go anywhere, I don't think. So, But I think the state here is really proactive and progressive for a government agency to, in terms of thinking about green infrastructure and how we can build up tidal wetlands now and, and restore these kinds of areas to at least mitigate the impacts of sea level rise and storms. Um, but I think we're a long way, but I think we're way ahead of the curve just not to say that we're in a great position yet, but California is in pretty good shape relative to a lot of the other parts of the country. I mean, I have colleagues in the southeast that spend time in North Carolina, for example. And I, I'm going to pick on South Carolina because I know it's going to keep you from. <laughs> but specifically in North Carolina, they just wrote sea level rise, you know, out, out of the game and said, well, there's no sea level rise. It's not going to accelerate, so you don't have to worry about it. By legal definition. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one way to do it. You can just write, you know, write a law. Not to even, it's not going to happen. <laughs> so they go to so some of my colleagues go to meetings where half the people say, I don't, there's not a problem, like, why are you even talking to me? And we don't have that kind of reception in California, so I think we're pretty progressive in actually thinking about real solutions now, um, before it's too late. Yes? So, so to carry on with that, mm -hmm. this information, it's all very scary um, and worrying, and uh, as people that work 
on beaches were obviously. <laughs> um, but how long? I mean, obviously, you, you've got some fantastic detailed information. So, how long would you say policymakers have, have had knowledge about this degree of inundation and, and the potential risk? Is it a couple of years? Is it a decade? Yeah. And then, you know, when when do we see the action on that? Um. Yeah. Uh, good question. So the first really statewide maps the Pacific Institute put out, which I think was in 2009, I believe, that kind of raised awareness that this is a, an issue and identified areas that are more vulnerable than others. And then some of the more detailed work that we've been doing has been coming out the last few years. And uh, so the state is taking notice, and there's been meetings at the state assembly that Gary and I have gone to. And so high-level lawmakers are now asking questions, even even more conservative ones are, I think, uh, asking questions like, is this, what do we have to deal with? When is this gonna happen? And so I think there's a lot of discussion going on at the state level now and up through the state agencies, which are really forward thinking, especially the Coastal Conservancy. And even the Coastal Commission has a, sometimes is a big bureaucracy, but they're thinking about this too. And we really have to look at extremes and events and not just look at a little bit of sea level rise and that's that's the end of it. So I think it's I think it's moving in the right direction from what I'm seeing. Yeah, so the political will is, is perhaps there to actually take action. Which is I think so. And a, and a winter like this is really helpful too because this is sort of a proxy for what we might expect more frequently in the future. So right now the state is moving really quickly to try and use bond money to support climate impacts research because they're saying, hey, look at this winter right now, we're seeing these effects all over the state. You know, this is a problem and people I think are opening their eyes and it's like the Hurricane Sandy effect to some extent, but not as extreme, but it kind of, you know, sets a bar, You're like, okay, this could happen now. <laughs> it's not some problem for our grandkids, you know, there's impacts now, it's gonna get worse, and, but there's, you know, it's not something that's just way off on the horizon. Yeah. So I have a sort of follow up on that, which is um, uh, anecdotally amongst people I know, academic -y type folks, mm -hmm. um, people are leaving the coast in terms of the very, very low lying coast. Either, right. I mean, there's also, we maybe we couldn't afford to live at the beach, but, but, but setting that aside, for people that do, um, there's sort of this quiet thing that I um, have noticed amongst folks where they kind of sell their house and they move to a little bit higher ground, as okay. it were. But it seems like nobody wants to talk about that. Cause it's a very mm -hmm. sensitive thing, and they don't want to freak anybody out and this and that. But, but um, I'm curious, say in your guys, your office, which is a bunch of folks that study sea level rise and stuff mm -hmm. like that, do a lot of people live at beach level? <laughs> uh, one of our colleagues I know had his house wiped out by a hurricane in the Gulf, and so he probably knew better. <laughs> but uh, I think most of us live a little bit higher elevations. <laughs> I'm just above the tsunami inundation zone. I know that for a fact. That seems to be that seems to be of note. That seems to be of note that people that study such things uh, don't live right at right. the beach. We should know better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. I'm telling my family to move off of Shelton Head. Like, what about <laughs> um, the general public awareness? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that, like the, the cartoon modeling. Yeah. Maybe sound obnoxious, but it helps because of that. It, having people look at charts and graphs, like, oh my god, I don't know how you check this. Yeah. Out. Right. All the cartoon stuff and actual public awareness riding on that wave of, well, we watched the pier get half knocked down and half the houses have sea lanes get washed into them. So, are, is there some sort of public relations policy that's happening or being promoted at all? Yeah, well, FEMA is doing a lot of that, but we have a very concerted outreach program. I think that's just as important. I think. We initially did this, I had no idea the scope of what it would take to make that happen, and we're actually about to hire a director of outreach because our staff just can't handle the demand and the need to really translate the science to all levels and to the general public, and you know, building like, like uh, you know, virtual reality tools and just like cool stuff so people can look at this and actually kind of have fun with it, and they have access to it, and it's not just you know, a bunch of you know, charts and the people kind of go blind right away and just, you know, it seems Don't like public awareness it. would create more political pressure. Yeah. Like it does with else. Yeah. Agreed. That's a, I think that's a huge part of science that's overlooked is that science translation and outreach component and engaging the public and not just you write a paper and then 100 people read it and that's it. It's mm -hmm. not. That's not the only. That's not the end of the game. Right. Those, those inundation maps are fantastically helpful, and I actually, you know, I have looked up like where is the tsunami inundation <laughs> <laughs> in my house. Yeah. Like, like all my friends that live on the beach, if they're to visualize it, it's really simple. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. So your Cosmos model is very cool. Are you able to go in there and look at adaptive management strategies? Like, if I put a sea level here, how does it change it? If I do whatever to this area, can right. I see what happens? Can I run simulations? That We're way? working on that now, actually. We got that question a lot. What if I put a seawall here, mm -hmm. if I nourish this beach? Mm -hmm. and so we're kind of a project with uh, Mark Stacy at Berkeley just on that in San Francisco Bay. Mm -hmm. As if we put levees in this part of the bay, how does it affect this community? And mm -hmm. it turns out it's really important in right. a place like San Francisco. <laughs> it, it changes the whole shape of the tidal wave. And right. if you, for example, if you levy South Bay, it actually raises water levels in North Bay because it constricts the tidal mm -hmm. wave, it causes amplification. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important. So we're trying to figure out ways to do that interactively. That's right. part of this project is how do we do that? Because right yeah. as it's set up now, absolutely not. Right. It's not it's possible. All it's all canned. We have X number of scenarios, and they're, mm -hmm. they are what they are, but we got lots of questions about yeah, beach nourishment, and what if we put a seawall here, or a right. levee, and yeah. Yeah, well, someone look, looks at it regionally, like, I know what I do up here, like, mm -hmm. really messes up down yeah. here, and I think a lot of people don't understand that, so it's right. really interesting to, to see the full effects of right. this little modification. And a classic event, a classic example is groins, right? Yeah. So yeah. someone puts in a groin, they put yeah. some beach in front of them, and then it erodes the beach next to them, and next to them, you know, you have 50 groins. Right. Right. All the way down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they just made a game out of it. Yeah. And then <laughs> the objective is to find... <laughs> Screw the other guy. <laughs> right. Without <laughs> being submerged. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you might get a whole population of people below 18 who are really interested if there's a good prize. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Future models, not death. Yeah, yeah, not death. Yeah. We actually have written into this new job description is virtual reality and gaming. Yeah. If you mm -hmm. can, yeah. you know, do something cool with that, then I think I could be really effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you played with C Sketch? Have you seen C Sketch? I have seen that. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be an interesting. I mean, I think that that has proven very helpful. I think in um, getting sort of feedback and and at least building at least basic feedback into people's potential clicks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. <coughs> yep. Have you done anything to look at like sea cliff erosion and um, groundwater? So uh, groundwater and how that influences the slow erosion? Right. No, that's a great question. Um, we have not looked at that no, directly, but I think that's a really important factor. And you know where the groundwater table is and how it's undermining the cliffs and what kind of failure you get is really important for you know, the hydrology of the cliffs. So. Sounds like a great student project. <laughs> what a great <laughs> project to that. stay another year, Patrick, and work <laughs> on that. That's good, dude. Cool. Thanks, man. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.